our readings for today uh, are, are very difficult ones to hear when you put them all together. In fact, they're so difficult, and uh, for, a, for uh, this sermon, I decided to make a substitution. I'm going to talk about the joy and pleasure of basket weaving. <laughs> Is that an acceptable substitution? I hope to say no. It's actually been, uh, when you look at the scriptures, uh, they are they're difficult readings. In the Old Testament reading, there is the awful passage from Genesis, where God is putting Abraham to the test. Take your son, go up on the hill, and kill him. Can you imagine a God who would demand that anyone would kill his own son? This passage used to be in the Good Friday liturgy, but it was too heavy for even Good Friday, so they put it here in Pentecost. It raises many questions, difficult questions. Who would want to worship a God who makes such outrageous demands? Then we have Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will thou hide thy face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? What are we supposed to feel uh, when we say this psalm together? Psalms are like meditation. And as we meditate and reflect on it, how are we supposed to feel uh, and deal with a God who hides his face from us? And the reading from Paul's letter to the Romans is one long essay on sin. And, you know, in the Episcopal, we don't talk about sin. Uh, there's a couple of subjects that we never mention. We don't deal with sin, we don't deal with sex, and we don't deal with uh, what else? Sin, sex, and Jesus. We don't mention Jesus too much either. Not in this church, but in a lot of churches don't talk too much. So Paul's letter to the epistle, one long essay on sin. The apostle Paul's explained sin as the opposite of obedience to God. Our catechism softens this a little by referring to sin as distorting our relationship with God, with other people, and with all creation. It's not exactly the same thing. It's all about obedience to God. And that takes us back to the first lesson, where God tests Abraham to check out his obedience. You're going to be the leader of my chosen people. I want to know what I'm getting. So he puts him to the test. Who wants to be uh, obedient to God who makes such outrageous demands? Some theologians call these uh, texts texts of terror. Text of terror. But like it or not, these are part of our sacred scripture. The scripture of the God revealed to us uh, in Holy Scripture. For most of us in the Episcopal Church, we're pretty good at ignoring these passages, especially when you know it has a happy ending. Oh, God's not going to really let Abraham kill his son. So it's much more comfortable for us to look away, to ignore these passages. Um, who really needs to confront the, the painful reality of the text of terror? But we are challenged to reconcile the violence in the Bible with the idea of a loving God. And so we tend to concentrate more on the many passages where God is depicted as loving, as nurturing, and as caring. It's rather fortunate for us that the scales are tipped from violence to love in the transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The Gospels and the New Testament are not entirely void of uh, violence, but on the whole they depict a God of love much more than a God of vengeance. 
The opposite is true in the Old Testament. It's full of violence, very much like the world in which we are living in right now. Regardless of how much or how little violence there is in our biblical narrative each week, it is difficult for us to come to terms with it. Even in today's gospel passage, Jesus is hardly overflowing with an affirmation of love. He speaks of rewards. Rewards for the prophets and rewards for the righteous people. But he also speaks of people who lose their reward. If the reward is eternal life, who wouldn't be concerned about losing it? I have to admit, for most of us, Christianity is a way to die, not a way to live. How many people lay in a casket in the center aisle here over the past many years who that was the first time they've been in church in a lot of cases? And the whole family gathers around, well, he's in a better place now. Hell is not a better place. The separation from God is not a better place. Doesn't it make us a little uneasy to think we could lose our reward? We could lose our salvation? We could be separated from God for all eternity? Jesus says that whoever denies him before others, he also will deny before God in heaven. Looking at the gospel reading from a modern translation might make it a little easier to understand. Uh, the message is not intended to be a, a, a technical translation of the Bible, not to be biblically accurate, but it adds a lot of words that sometimes make it just easier to understand. Jesus is speaking and he says, Anyone who accepts what you do, accepts me. The one who sent you, anyone who accepts what you do, accepts me, the one who sent you. Anyone who accepts what I do, accepts my Father who sent me. Accepting a messenger of God is as good as being God's messenger. That sounds important. Except, uh, accepting someone's help is as good as giving someone help. Isn't it tough sometimes to accept help in some situations? Jesus says, this is a large work I've called you into, but don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small. Give a cool cup of water to someone who is thirsty, for instance. The smallest act of giving or receiving makes you a true apprentice. You, you won't lose out on a thing. I like the way the message translates that passage. I read that passage 20 times this week and say, how, how do I come to terms with all of that? I know it's important because it is grouped together with the text of terror. Maybe that's what you each should be uh, concentrating on. Acceptance, giving, and receiving. Not fear, not violence, not vengeance, but welcome, acceptance, love, giving, and receiving. The world has had enough of retribution. The world has had enough of aggression. The world has had enough of terrorism. And the Bible had more than its share of these things because, because the Bible is about the journey of mankind as much as it is about man and God's relationship with man. It's our history being unfolded when we read all those texts of terror in uh, the Old Testament. So maybe one lesson to learn from all this is about our free will, your choice, my choice, our choice. Because we are all created in the image of God, we are free to make choices. 
free to choose love, free to create, free to live in harmony, free to give reason. And then there's the flip side of all that. We're also free to hate, free to kill, free to cause discord, and free to deny the good sense that God has given to us. Abraham could have said, no, God, I will not sacrifice my son. He probably would have recognized that as a, as a good choice. Stand up for what you believe. Stand up for the one whom you love. But Abraham chose to be obedient to God. He went along with it. A big effort. He had a couple of extra guys and a pack of plywood and to travel a long distance and to set that all up, walking along with your son, knowing that you're going to kill him? Can you imagine the, the, the horror of uh, Abraham feeling that as he walked along? He could have said no, but he decided to be obedient. The psalmist in, the, in Psalm 13 uh, could have cried out, I don't trust you, O God. Instead, he chose to praise God, and God responds with saving help. Paul could have insisted that we should be free to sin because we're no longer under the law. You don't have to follow the rules. You're not under that. You're under grace. He proclaims that our true freedom is in righteousness, and then God gives us the free gift of eternal life. It makes you wonder if we get all these blessings for behaving badly, how much God loves us. How much he must love us when he continually pours out his love, his blessing, his acceptance on us over and over and over again. In his disappointment so we break the law, disappointments when we take his grace for granted. He comes back with more love, more grace, more acceptance. How much does God love us? The answer, of course, is infinitely, without bounds, without reservation, without qualification of any kind. God loves us enough to overlook our wrongdoings, and there's plenty of them. God loves us enough to pardon our offenses. God loves us enough to forgive us. And so how are we to respond? With hatred, malice, fear, and prejudice? Or with love, forgiveness, mercy, and faith? We were a disappointment to God when we lived under the law. So he sent Jesus with a message of love. And no, we no longer live under the law, but we live under grace. The unmerited favor of God. We don't deserve it, we, don't, we shouldn't get it, but we get it anyway. You can't earn your salvation, you, all you have to do is accept it. It's a free gift. And now we're in danger of taking God's love for granted. Back in the old days, we were breaking the breaking his rules. Now we're in danger of taking God's love for granted. This doesn't make any difference what I do. He's going to save me anyway. The devil has promoted a doctrine of universal salvation. Everybody who dies goes to heaven. Check and uh, you hear, well, ask somebody two questions. When you die, if you were to die right now, where would you spend eternity? And listen to the answer. If they don't say, I will be in heaven because Jesus is my savior, uh, that's the only answer you can give. But you hear a lot of quibbling. Well, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm not that bad either. And they go on and on, give you all kinds of half-hearted answers, full of vague uh, understanding of what the gospel is. There is no doubt, folks. It's
It's not supposed to be a mystery. It's not supposed to be uncertain. If you love Jesus, your salvation is guaranteed. You will not lose it of any kind. The answer is clear. We're giving a choice. We can choose Jesus. That sounds so simple in this church. But I listen to sermons and I listen to uh, speeches and, uh, and sometimes they go on and never mention Jesus' name once. Jesus is the forgotten person in the Christian church. Try to run churches without, without Jesus. Maybe we assume it. Maybe we say we don't have to talk about it. We can just build up around it and God will take care of the rest. I don't think so. I think our hearts, our minds, our lives have to be dedicated absolutely and completely uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are given a choice. It's up to each and every one of us and every day we live to focus our attention on the, the one who is Lord of our lives and our Savior. We want to be saved, but we don't want to lost. But he is the boss. He's the Lord. The Lord and the Savior. We can seek to oppress and control others, but to amass power and wealth, and to serve the demons of this world. Or, we can do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. We can keep Jesus at the absolute center of our lives. Then we can join the psalmist who wrote Psalm 13, but toward the end of it, when he turns from the gloom and doom to uh, the, the praise at the end of his psalm and says, God, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord 